Yeah, uh, well, we're going to talk about uncertainty and error. So let me ask you maybe this map. Uh, is familiar this map to you? Long time ago, only two days. <laughs> but we did uh, the case on Monday where we mapped the, the lead concentration of the soil in this touristic scenery, scenic part of the south of the Netherlands. And uh, this was our result, something similar to this. High values in this hotspot area and close to the river, lower values uh, far away from the river. And of course, this map is not error free. And we actually were able to quantify that error too with a Krieging standard deviation. I hope you remember. Uh, that was the nice thing about geostatistics. It does not only do the spatial interpolation, but it also quantifies the uncertainty of the interpolated values. And uh, we got these kind of maps. We did the feedback on Monday too, uh, where we looked at them. And here you can really see that the transacts along which the point data were collected, because close to an observation location, the uncertainty is, is lower, far away, especially when you do like extrapolation, the uncertainty becomes bigger. So the Krieging standard deviation is really a measure of how accurate are your interpolations because it's the spread, the standard deviation of your uncertainty. Well, today, this afternoon's focus is really not so much about these maps, but these kind of maps. This, 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 what is this, this uncertainty? And why is it important? Why should we pay attention to uncertainty? Uh, well, I have a, a list of reasons. Maybe it's not exhaustive and maybe you have other reasons, but let's look at them. Well, I think any self-respecting researcher, <coughs> before you make a map public, you would like to know, you want to check what is the quality of my map. Is my map accurately enough to be published, to be given to, the, to my client, to my uh, user? So. You don't want to ba publish bad maps. You want to make sure that they are accurate, or at least satisfy a criterion, and maybe even better communicate that accuracy. Now, if we are able to quantify the accuracy of maps, we're also able to compare different models, different approaches, uh, which one does the best job, which one produces the most accurate map. So that would help us to evaluate which is the best method, and also it would maybe help us to, to see how can we improve our map. Uh, yeah, we don't make maps just for the fun of it, for ourselves, but we usually have a user in mind. That user could be a colleague, could be an external party, could be ourselves too. And the user has a certain wish. Hmm? They want to use the map for a certain purpose. So is the map usable? Can we use it for the intended purpose? That depends on the accuracy, the quality of the map. So also here, it's important to know about the accuracy of a map. Because only then can we decide whether the map is usable for our intended purpose. Um, yeah, we will talk a bit about uncertainty propagation uh, this afternoon. So uh, when our soil maps are used as input to models, like an erosion model, a crop growth model, um, well, all kinds of models, then the uncertainties, the errors in those maps will propagate to the output of the model. And, well, we can only quantify that uncertainty propagation if we know what is the uncertainty, the error in the input map to start with. So that's why we need the accuracy of maps. And the output of such a model, such an environmental model, will also be used for decision making by poli politicians or by decision makers, by the government, or maybe by industry. And so um, they also want to know how accurate is the end result of an environmental model in order to decide whether it is usable. Um, yeah, of course you can quantify the accuracy of a map with a validation. And we'll talk about that too, independent validation. You put aside some data or you collect, after you prepare the map, you collect some independent data and you compare. How well did I do? Ba ba basically quite simple. Just confront the map, the predictions, with the independent observations. We'll talk about that. It's very useful, very important, but it only provides you with a summary measure of how well did I do. Like a root mean squared error, mean error, these kind of summary measures. 
And sometimes we want spatially explicit measures of the uncertainty, like the Krieging can do. The Krieging standard deviation tells you for each and every location how accurate is the prediction. So if we need spatially explicit uncertainties, we cannot really work with validation studies, because they only provide summary statistics. So these are all reasons why we would like to pay attention to uncertainty. So what will we do this afternoon? We'll start with a little bit looking at, okay, what is it really, uncertainty, and what is error? And is there a difference between error and uncertainty? I usually, I sometimes I mix them up, I use them interchangeably, but actually I, I think there is a difference between the two. So we'll talk a bit about that. Then we will discuss how can we model uncertainty statistically with probability distributions. And we did, basically we did that already on Monday to some degree. So we'll just continue that a bit. Uh, then we'll talk about the uncertainty propagation. How can you analyze the propagation of uncertainties through environmental models, like through an erosion model, through a crop growth model, through a climate model, a hydrological model, and so on. We'll talk, like I said before, we'll talk a little bit about validation of maps, of soil maps, digital soil maps, using uh, probability sampling, ideally. And, well, it was also announced in the title of, the, of this module, we'll also talk about carbon stock computations um, from soil properties, uh, but we'll also take the uncertainty propagation into account. And in a computer practical, we will uh, analyze how uncertainties in soil properties propagate through the computation <coughs> of the carbon stock. And we'll do that for a, a part of Borneo in Indonesia, just as an example. Okay, that's the plan. You're very quiet, but if you have questions, don't uh, hesitate to ask, okay? <laughs> so we'll start with the first, error and uncertainty. Uh, yeah, I think we are, wh when we are uncertain about a soil property, about a, a map, a predicted soil property, basically it means we do not know its true value, right? If you would know the true value, if you would know the pH at this location, is uh, 6.3 and I'm certain about it, well then already I say there's no uncertainty, you just know the value. So if you don't know the exact value, that makes you uncertain about that exact value. Uh, we may be uncertain, but it doesn't mean that we don't know anything. We have some idea about the pH of the soil. We know that it's not 20, we don't know it's not negative. I mean, we may even know that it's higher than 7 or below 5 or things like that. So usually we have some idea, we do know something. We have an estimate of the soil property as well, but we are aware that that estimate is only an estimate, only a representation of the true value. There will be, a, probably there will be an error in our estimate. The estimate will deviate from the true value. Uh, the true value, like in this example, might be, of the pH, might be 6.3, but the map says it is 5.9. So the estimate, the prediction, differs from the true value. And that difference, that is what I define as the error. So the error is simply the difference between the true value and our representation of that variable. And when we are aware that there probably is an error in our map, that makes us uncertain about the true value. Because we only have the representation, we only have the estimate, we don't have the true value. We are uncertain about the true value because the estimate is only an, an estimate, a representation of the true value. <coughs> so that's the difference between error and uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty is a property of people, it is subjective. I am uncertain about the pH of the soil. The pH of the soil is not uncertain, I am uncertain about it. Usually, sometimes I also say pH is uncertain, but actually if you really want to do define it properly, I think you should say I am uncertain, we are uncertain about the pH of the soil. Because we do not know the true value. The error is the difference between true and estimated. And also the problem with the error is we usually do not know it, because if we would know the error, we would know that the error in our estimate is 0 0.4, we would immediately correct for it. So the error exists, but we don't know it unless we go there, take a soil sample, analyze it, and then we would know the error, and then we would correct our estimate. 
but we cannot do that everywhere, right? Yeah. So we know that there is an error, and we also usually know pretty well, uh, have some idea about how big that error could be. For example, we may know that the, the chances are equal that the error is positive or negative. You remember maybe from Monday, we talked about ordinary Krieging, and we said the sum of the Krieging weights must add up, they must add up to one, because then the prediction is unbiased. No systematic over or under estimation. Well, that basically means that you know that the error on average is zero. And we may also know that the error is not likely to be bigger than a certain value, like the pH estimate. Well, it's unlikely that the error is bigger than one or two units. So we're starting to come up with something like a probability distribution for the error. That's what we will be doing this afternoon. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe to, to play a little bit with uncertainty, uh, <laughs> I'll show you a letter, and I would like you to show that letter, and also write down how certain you are that this is the correct letter. Just a simple exercise. Okay. Not so difficult, I guess. So <laughs> is this still, you can write down your best guess of the letter and are you how certain you are? Hundred percent certain or <coughs> this one? No problems. <laughs> Maybe it's just too easy, the exercise. And I have a final one. So write down the letter and how certain are you that that letter that you think it is is correct. And well, I try to make it in this way that the, uh, the, the, it gets more and more difficult so that you lose some of the uncertainty in your certainty. And I think with this one, I don't know what, what you think, what letter it is. I hear a Q. Oh, now I need a prescription sunglasses or some kind of glasses to read this. You need what? <laughs> there are no special glasses that allow you to read this, right? Okay, so. Uh, I hear a Q, is that the only option, or? O, o could also be O, uh, which one is it? Could be a C, yeah. Hmm? Could be a C. C? A C, could be a C, yeah. Yeah, so you know, if you start thinking about it, there's m different options, and so you're no longer certain, right? You end up with a list of possible true answers, and you don't know which one it is. And each has maybe a certain probability of being the true one. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to uh, model, model the true unknown reality as a list of possible values with a probability attached to each of those. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, actually, I fooled you a bit here because I say which letter, and I actually use an eight, so that was not very nice of me. So yeah. A G here. Could have been a G, like a, like a lowercase g, yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll do that next time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I used the Q, but you couldn't know, right? So you were uncertain about which letter did I use. So for soil, yeah, this just b basically what we do when we are uncertain about the soil property, we represent it as a probability distribution. And normally we would use like the normal distribution, that is the most li what we by default might use. But we are aware that some, and we discussed that also on Monday, that sometimes it, the distribution should be more a skew distribution. For example, I think for organic carbon concentration of the soil, yeah, there, it's not likely that it's a, it, that it's a symmetric distribution because for sure it can never be less than zero. So there you're certain that it's not below zero. And sometimes it might have a very high value. It, it may occur once in a while. If you're not certain about that, that of those extreme values, you would probably use a, a, a skew distribution. And I just plotted here an example where actually I'm quite uncertain, you see, because the distribution is quite wide. Um, the five quantile and the 95 quantile, so that between these two limits, you have a 90% 
certainty that the true value is within these limits, they are quite far apart. So you are actually quite uncertain about the soil organic carbon concentration at that location. If the distribution would be narrower, uh, we can make it as narrow as we like. If we are able to do that, uh, we of course we want to have a realistic representation of our uncertainty. If it would be narrower, we would be less uncertain. And the pathological case where that distribution is like peep, like this, compressed to uh, what they call a delta function, then all uncertainty would have disappeared. And with Krieging, we actually get that if we predict at a location where we had a measurement, right? and if we ignore the measurement error. But usually with Krieging, we try to make it as narrow as possible. You Maybe you remember the probability distribution of the error. Huh? We, we talked about on Monday we had z at location x0 minus z hat at location x0. And that was our prediction error. You remember that. We choose those Krieging weights in a way to make that probability distribution, well, centered on zero, unbiased, with an as narrow as possible Krieging standard deviation. So basically, we take the same approach here, like we're doing here. We model our uncertainty about the true value of Z at that prediction location by the error which has a probability distribution. We list all possible values that that error might take, and we attach a probability, or a probability density, maybe I should say, to each of those possible values. Okay. So that is all we need. We need a probability distribution function to characterize uncertainty if we take a statistical approach, and that's the approach we take here. There are also people who use fuzzy sets, there's people who use scenarios, so there's different ways of dealing with uncertainty, but we take a probabilistic, a statistical approach, modeling uncertainty with probability distributions. Um, well, at one single location, we need one univariate, or you might say marginal, one-dimensional probability distribution could be the normal distribution. Here I have just, I don't know why I put that here, but just the probability density equation eh, of, of that uh, normal distribution. It will have this shape. You're all quite familiar with that. Maybe you also remember that you have plus or minus two sigma is 95% of the cases. Plus or minus three sigma is 99.7% of the cases, and so on. So you have almost everything within plus or minus three sigma. So the sigma is a good summary measure of the uncertainty, the standard deviation. Uh, but sometimes we also would like to you want to use a log normal distribution or a uniform distribution, exponential, everything is possible. You could also have distributions that are not parametrized, reduced to a number of parameters. But I don't know if, for those of you who are familiar, for example, with Bayesian calibration, with prior distributions and posterior distributions, and Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques. Well, that's an area in itself, but that also produces probability distributions of parameters of models, for example, of, of inputs, which are not parametrized into a standard shape, but could have any shape. Uh, why do we use the, the normal distribution so often? Because there's this theorem in statistics, the central limit theorem, which says if you average random draws from whatever distribution you like, and you average them, they tend to go to the normal distribution. That's also why we see it so often in nature. If, we make, if I make a frequency distribution of the height of all the people in Wageningen, and I look at the histogram, it looks pretty normal because of this central limit theorem. So there is a reason why it is often a convenient choice. And I think I also, maybe I'm not sure if I mentioned that on Monday, but also the normal distribution has very nice mathematical properties. So it's easy to work with, relatively. Well, that's the marginal distribution, but we are dealing with digital soil mapping, spatial variables, the lead concentration of the soil varies in space. So we actually need to characterize a space, the uncertainty in a spatial variable. So at each and every location, like over here and over here, we need those probability distributions. 
And they are given, when you do the Krieging, we get them, right? We get to know at each location what is the center, the Krieging prediction, what is the uncertainty, the spread, it's the Krieging standard deviation. So these ones, we get them for each and every location where we make a prediction. But it's not enough. We need a little bit more in some cases. We also need to know how are they correlated with each other, those errors. So we also need two-dimensional, bivariate distributions. So the error at this location and the error at this location, one might be plotted on this axis, the other one on this axis, and then we get this two-dimensional probability distribution. And if it would be, I could also draw it maybe as, as contour lines, just to clarify. And we might have Z hat, uh, then I put, I don't know, put the hat first or second, doesn't really matter, Zx0 minus Z predicted, x0 on this axis. Maybe another location, shall we say, location, uh, well, x1. <laughs> on this axis, so we have the error at one location, the error at the other location. They have these marginal, one-dimensional probability distributions, so maybe I can, I hope you can understand what I'm trying to draw here, project a distribution on these axes, and maybe they are centered on zero, so the, the zero point will be over here. And now we want to extend this model which only characterizes the uncertainty at each and every location separately. We want to include the correlations between those errors. We need to go for a bivariate distribution. Well, if they would be uncorrelated, if the error at location x0 would not be correlated, would have no correlation with the error at location x1, then the ISO lines, the contour lines of equal probability would be circles. Okay, so there's like this mountain here, over here, the bell shape, maybe if it's a normal distribution, two-dimensional curve over here with the highest point over here, and then when I, when I, the radius becomes bigger, I decrease the answer. Is it clear? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm writing here circles. There could also be ellipses if the uncertainty at location x0 is, for example, bigger than at location x1, then, the ellipse, then we would get ellipses like this. Now, if there is a correlation between the errors, and like, for example, these two locations, they are not that far apart. So maybe it's likely if I overestimate it, if I have a positive error, uh, uh, or, well, if, I, if the true value is higher than the predicted value, if I underestimated the true value at this location, I probably also underestimated over here. So what happens to these contour lines if the things become correlated? Yeah, stretched. And actually what you get is rotated ellipses. So it will mean maybe a bit like this. So they also stretched, you're right. Because if this is positive, higher than zero, this is likely also positive, higher than zero. So you end up in this quadrant over here. You have a higher probability of ending up here, or here, of course, when both are negative. They are positively correlated. It's not very likely that you end up here or here, because that would mean that I overestimate here and underestimate there, and the other or the other way around. And that doesn't happen that often because the errors tend to be positively correlated. And in geostatistics, we can quantify all this with well, you remember the semivariogram, because the semivariogram is really about the degree of spatial correlation. So when you take a geostatistical model. Of the like we did on Monday, you are able not only to quantify, characterize the uncertainty at each location with a probability distribution, but you can also quantify, characterize mathematically the 
probability distribution of joint errors, errors at multiple locations, and not only two locations, also three, four, five, whatever. And then you have fully characterized the uncertainty in your soil property, in your map of your soil property. And well, once we've done that, we can, we can uh, for example, uh, compute the lower and the upper limit of prediction intervals and plot them also spatially. So this is our Krieging result, our most likely value of the lead concentration of the soil. This is the lower limit and this is the upper limit of a 95 or 90% prediction interval. And uh, those of you who are familiar with the Global Soil Map project, it's in the uh, specifications document of Global Soil Map that we don't only want to produce this map. We always also want to produce this map and this map. We want to characterize the uncertainty in our digital soil maps with the lower and upper limits of the 90% prediction interval. And that's, I think, for users also very useful. Huh? If this map, like in this example, it's all black here almost, well, except for here. And here it's of ma more blue-purple, so there's a big difference between the lower and the upper, so you're quite uncertain, actually. Huh? If those maps would be very similar, then we would have a very narrow distribution, the uncertainty would be low. So just comparing the lower and the upper limit tells us already how accurate, how uncertain we are. Okay. What we also did on Monday, and I didn't explain that, and I, some people told me afterwards, well, I'm not really sure what I did there, and is we, we created these possible realities. So we'll talk about it a bit more now, and also explain how, how these are created. This is like, like throwing the dice. Huh? So we have a probability distribution. Well, let's do the one-dimensional again. It's a bit easier. Uh, let's, let's take the Gaussian, uh, the normal one. For so we have here, let's say, the soil property. Uh, here we have the probability density. Uh, well, this would be our Krieging prediction, right? That's the most likely value. And then we have a spread, the Krieging standard deviation. And well, the very first slide this afternoon showed a map of the predicted lead and the standard deviation of the lead. Uh, the lower and the upper limit were this one and this one. Now, when we do this spatial stochastic simulation, we use a random number generator to sample from this probability distribution. So we just start with a, a seed and we use this random number. Maybe, we, maybe we'll get this value or this or this or this or this. Well, anything goes. But of course, values close to the prediction, which have a high probability, will occur more often than values that are far away that have a very low probability density. So I show you here six possible realities. If I wouldn't produce six, but I would produce, uh, let's say, 10,000, and at any location I would make a histogram of those 10,000 simulated values, that histogram would really look very closely <coughs> like my Krieging probability distribution. So that's the idea. You generate possible realities by sampling from that probability distribution. And why do we do that? We do that because we need it for our uncertainty propagation that I will explain later. Uh, in a way, they also communicate, convey the uncertainty that we have. Basically, you can interpret each of these six maps as one of them could be the true unknown reality. I just don't know which one it is. Well, actually, there's an infinite number that I can create, and each of them could, have, could be the true one. I just don't know which one it is. It's my uncertainty. And if they're all very similar, well, then you know that your uncertainty is small. If they're all very different, then you know that your uncertainty is large. 
Well, it's all related, of course, to the width, the spread in that probability distribution. So we know now pretty sure that in this part of the area we have high lead concentrations because all those simulated realities confirm that. We also know that near the river we have higher values than farther away. But there is still some uncertainty left because, well, here I created some low values and here it's much less so and here even less. So there are differences between those simulated realities. Now you might think that's really easy to generate such possible realities. You just use a random number generator. But the problem is you have to take the spatial correlation into account. What you simulate here is correlated with what you simulate here. So the algorithm that generates these has to take those spatial correlations into account. And I'll explain that now. So, well, I think I explained, I told you most of this. So when you do the Krieging, you go for the most likely value, the one with the highest probability density, the center of the probability distribution. When we use spatial stochastic simulation, we generate possible realities by sampling from that probability distribution. So the examples that I showed you on Monday, I hope you remember them. They were also created in this way. Uh, and they're, they, they're quite different, those four. Why are they different? Because they use different semivariograms. The spatial correlation was different. I had used this algorithm to generate those possible realities uh, using a random number generator, but I told here that the variogram is a pure nugget variogram, so it could do every cell independently. But here the variogram had a zero nugget and a very high, large range. So you get this, this kind of reality. Now, of course, I could do it again, and I would get a different reality, maybe not with the blue over here. The blue might, have, might be over here or somewhere else, but the spatial structure would be the same because I have used the same semivariogram, which I impose when I generate these realities. So how can you do that? Well, there's several techniques. In the past, in geostatistics, they used a technique known as turning bands. It was some kind of thing. But since about 15, 20 years, I think most of the uh, algorithms make use of this, what they call sequential Gaussian simulation. The nice thing about this technique is that it's, it's like exact. There are no approximations. But it is computationally more demanding than Krieging, and, and we'll come to talk about that also later. And in the practical this afternoon, you will be doing this as well. Uh, well, the case study that we do doesn't, is not that big, so I think we won't uh, have, like, we have to wait for 10 minutes or so. It's still quit pretty fast, but it is slower than the Krieging. So, how does it work? Um, you have your study area, like, in our case, the lead concentration of the soil, why not use that example? Well, it looks a bit like this. <laughs> uh, we had these uh, data points. And you want to create a possible reality using this algorithm. So what you do, you, you go to a location that you haven't been to before. Maybe uh, over here. You do a Krieging, ordinary Krieging, regression Krieging, I don't care. G given your geostatistical model, you have uh, assumed either a constant trend or a trend that is a function of covariance, doesn't matter. You make your prediction over here. So you get a prediction, but you also get the uncertainty. The Basically, what you get is a probability distribution, right? And this, this, the center of that distribution is your prediction, the standard deviation. So it is, of course, based on the observations you had here and on the variogram that you had estimated. And if we would do Krieging, we would go for the center. But when you do spatial stochastic simulation, you draw a random value, a value from that probability distribution using a random number generator. So um, I don't know, maybe this value here or some over here. We get some value, and we assign that value to this location, the randomly generated value. And we add, yes? Sorry, just a, a quick question. So is that, is that how you are constantly refining the global source database? Is that each time 
we get a new point. It works out that new probability of the error, and it regenerates that probability surface. Is that, is that what you guys basically do? When we do the soil bridge, yeah. no, soil, soil bridge doesn't do any spatial stochastic simulation. It only does interpolation, prediction. So it's just the prediction. Yeah. Because we have, you know, when you do this spatial stochastic simulation, you don't get only one realization. You get many, as many as you like. So when we do soil grids, we go, we, when we do soil grids, we really go for the most likely value everywhere. Right? We don't use Krieging at the moment, we use machine learning, but essentially it is just trying to make the best prediction of your unknown soil property anywhere in the area, given the information, the data you have, the covariates and the point data. I don't think we do uh, anything like this in soil grids. Okay? Yeah. So, we went to this location. If we would do Krieging, we would go for the center of that probability distribution, the Krieging distribution. But when we do spatial stochastic simulation, we randomly sample from this probability distribution. And we assign that value to that location. And we add the simulated value to our data set. So if we had started with n observations after I simulated this location, I suddenly have n plus 1 observations, because the simulated value is treated as if it were a measurement. And I go to a next location, move to another location. So maybe, maybe over here. And I repeat the procedure. I do the Krieging. I get a probability distribution, a conditional Krieging probability distribution, as they call it, in this location. And instead of using the center value, we again sample from that probability distribution, assign that value to this location, and move to a next location. And add this one to the data set. So now we have n plus 2 observations. And we go to a next location. And we keep on repeating this produce. Well, usually we would use a grid, right? And we would visit all centers of the grids. So when you have to do the final, last empty grid cell, this will be a huge number. A little bit depend on the resolution of your grid and the extent of your study area, but it might easily be 10,000 or 50,000 observations, because all those previously simulated values are included in your conditioning data set. And that is how you preserve that spatial correlation. That's why there are differences between these four. Right? That's how you make sure that the spatial correlation is preserved. Um, yeah, and that's why this spatial simulation is, is computationally demanding. And I think, I, well, I'm not sure uh, if we discussed it on Monday, but when you do the GSTAT and you use this function Krieger, with a lot of parameters, well, you use n sim equal, I don't know, what did we say, 9? Uh, when you provide this parameter, n sim, it, uh, aha, you don't want to do Krieging, you want to do spatial stochastic simulation. So it's exactly the same function, but just by providing this extra parameter, and uh, you, well, 9, and we might also make it 100 or 1,000, it will create as many possible realities as you specified over here. If you only want one, well, you would write here one. You make one possible reality. There was another parameter too. It was I've n max equal, I don't know, 25 for example. This was the difference between local and global Krieging. You remember when we do the Krieging, we condition, we compute Krieging weights given all the observations. When you specify this n max, you only use the closest 25 observations. So, for example, when we need to predict over here, we would look in a circle, let's say, 
and use only the 25 nearest observations. And that includes the previously simulated values. And when the n becomes 10,000, yeah, then it really pays off to do this n max. So what you did on Monday, if you drop out the n max parameter, you will see that the creaking will slow down. It will take more longer. Well, that's basically the idea when you do spatial stochastic simulation. Yes? Yeah, why do we need it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the next topic is about uncertainty propagation, and we will see that we need it for our uncertainty propagation. Okay? Um, yeah. If you want to predict at a location what is the soil value, what is the pH of the soil over there, you would do Krieging eh, or machine learning or whatever, because you want to have the most likely the one with the highest probability. That's, that's what you want, the center of that probability. You wouldn't want to simulate something higher or lower. You want to go for the... So if your goal is to make the best map, the most likely map, you would use Krieging. But you also remember, by the way, from Monday, Krieging smooths the reality. So it produces a smooth version of the reality. And these simulations... Okay, they don't reproduce the reality because you don't know the reality, but at least the spatial structure of those realities is similar, equal to the spatial structure of your true reality. So, for example, here there was some noise on top. When you do a Krieging with this kind of reality, it would be really smooth. But you know that the reality is not smooth because there is a nugget, there is a short distance spatial variation. So at least those simulations, they reproduce that. They show you what the spatial structure of the reality might look like. It's just that you don't know where the highs and the lows are. But to answer your question, there is use in using spatial stochastic simulation, in particular for this uncertainty propagation, but I still have to explain that later. Okay? Just to... Uh, to show you also in another example, in, in animation mode, those possible realities. Eh? I can put them one next to the other, but I can also present them one after the other. So in an animation fashion. So these could all be the unknown true reality. It's just an, a, an example, is a case that I created. Uh, well, what we actually see is that, well, they're all different, but the red part, the yellow part, is always in this corner, and the blue part is always in that corner, and that is because we had observations here. In the center of these circles, we knew the true value. So, uh, when we do the spatial stochastic simulation, we visit all those locations that haven't been measured, and that's where we generate the possible realities. And so there, if you have, like here, I had the black dots and the green dots, so there were some black dots where you knew the soil property. And if you know, if you measure yellow, red, high values over here, then near to those locations, you are certain, more or less, that you won't have blue over here, right? Because of the spatial correlation, you have information. The Krieging distribution over here has a high center value. The Krieging distribution over here has a low center value because you're in the blue area. So you can tell from these simulations that what we used is what they call conditional simulation. You have prior knowledge, you have measurements at measurement locations. And then you generate possible realities conditional on what you had measured. And that's why all those realizations have the yellow-red part over here and the blue part over here. Uh, I'm not sure if it works out very well, but for example over here, hopefully the variation between those multiple simulated values is less big than like over here. Because here the Krieging standard deviation is bigger because there are no measurements nearby. So there's larger uncertainty, more variation should be reflected in the simulations. 
Here it's always red, maybe a bit orange, but it's quite stable because you have so much information. Okay, does this work? Yeah. Uh, another slide I stole from one of my, my uh, lectures is, uh, this is actually not about soil, this is about rainfall. This is the annual rainfall in Turkey. And Turkey, well, uh, transect from west to east. I just took a transect through the whole country. So these are, I don't know what, well, they are more than kilometers. The, not sure what, what the units are, not that important. So we took a transect through Turkey and we plot the annual rainfall at each and every location along that, uh, that transect using Kriging because we had measurement meteorological stations in Turkey and we interpolated using Kriging. So the Kriging line is the black line over here. Huh? Kriging produced a smooth version of the reality. The dashed purple line is plus or minus Kriging standard deviation. Or maybe plus or minus two Kriging standard deviations. Yes? <laughs> Okay, oh, you were just, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and then the, the red, the green, and the blue line are possible realities, simulated realities. So each of these could be the true one. We just don't know which one it is. That's basically our claim. And they're all centered around the black line, but sometimes they're above, sometimes below, because you just don't know, eh? The Kriging goes for the most likely value. On average, you get it right. But the actual value might be higher or lower. And how much higher, how much ho lower is derived from the Kriging standard deviation. So the spread, the fluctuation around the line, is also reflected in that way. Uh, well, we used here uh, the, the ordinary Kriging case with a normal distribution. So there's something strange happening uh, going on here. That's actually over here. You can see. Rainfall, of course, can never be below zero. So this is uh, like a mismatch in our, we assume a normal distribution, which can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that's why some of those realizations produce actually negative rainfall. It's just a limitation of our model, which assumed a, a normal distribution. Uh, we, we could uh, ra replace negative values by zero or, or or we could have assumed a log normal distribution, then we wouldn't have had this problem. Okay. Just, I'm just trying to explain to you the difference between the Kriging, which is a smooth version of the reality everywhere predicting the most likely value, and stochastic simulation where you generate a possible reality using a random number, sampling from that probability distribution. Okay. Right, uh, I think I need to speed up a little bit. We have talked about error, uncertainty. We've talked about statistical modeling of uncertainty, also in the spatial context, where we are able to actually include spatial correlation in modeling the uncertainty. Now we would like to talk about uncertainty propagation. Well, uncertainty propagation is really about uh, when we as digital soil mappers are finished, we produce maps, but those maps are going to be used in models uh, like uh, a soil acidification model or an erosion model or a crop yield model. Uh, those models need soil information as input. Uh, maybe a slope angle is just an example where you, the only input is your digital elevation model. You compute the slope very easily from the elevation. So basically we have some kind of model which requires inputs and produces output. Now the input is uncertain. There are errors in that input. They will propagate to the output. So the goal of uncertainty propagation analysis is to quantify the uncertainty in the output given the uncertainty in the input. Uh, here's an example where the suitability of growing maize is derived from soil, from elevation and so on. And just, uh, a graphical illustration. I put this slide in because it's taken from a book by Peter Burrow, 
and he was my supervisor when I did my PhD, so it's like my uh, tribute to him that I <laughs> keep this slide in. <laughs> okay. So how do we, can we analyze the propagation of uncertainty? One way of doing that is called the Monte Carlo method. And, well, you know, I guess Monte Carlo, the city in the south of France, where there's lots of casinos, uh, gambling, so it's really about random numbers. So how does that method work? Uh, illustrated by means of an example, it's not a soil example, it's about uh, computing the slope from the elevation. So we have here a digital elevation model of a part of Aus the Austrian Alps. Uh, elevation ranging from 1700 up to 2600 meters. Well, we can compute a slope map from that elevation map easily. But now let's suppose there is an error, there's uncertainty about the digital elevation model. Let the standard deviation of that error be plus or minus 10 meter. That means we don't know the true elevation. We only have a representation, an estimate. The true elevation might be different. So we generate possible realities using the spatial stochastic simulation algorithms. We, each of these could be the true one. We just don't know which one it is. So we generate many possible realities, and for each of these, we compute the corresponding slope. So we generate a possible reality, run the model, compute the slope, and do that for each of those possible realities. And basically, now we know how uncertain we are about the slope. Eh? From the uh, range of values that you get at each location, that, tell, that tells me I could plot maybe a computer histogram at each location about or computer standard deviation of the spread this in my outputs that conveys, that tells me how uncertainty in the inputs has propagated to the output. So this is how this Monte Carlo algorithm works. You have to repeat many times. Uh, here I write at least a hundred times, but maybe you need, uh, sometimes you need a thousand times, and uh, you can actually also calculate w when is it sufficient. There are some statistics for that. But anyway, quite a large number of times. So it is a computationally demanding technique, right? Because you need many um, runs of your model. If the model is as simple as computing the slope from a digital elevation model, that's okay. But if it is a, a weather model or a global circulation model or uh, maybe a time-consuming hydrological model, groundwater flow model, that may take a lot of time. But what do you do? You repeat many times, you simulate the realization of your uncertain input, you run your model and store the output. And if you've done that a hundred times or, long or more often, you can analyze all those outputs by computing summary statistics, like the mean. Well, the mean is just, as before, the most likely value of your model output. But you will also com for sure compute the standard deviation or maybe those 5 and 95 quantiles to get an, un an idea about the uncertainty, the error in your model output. Okay, so that is uh, how you can analyze how uncertainty propagates through model using the Monte Carlo method. And maybe that now answers your question. We need this spatial stochastic simulation to apply the Monte Carlo uncertainty propagation algorithm to models that have spatially distributed inputs. Okay, uh, we also wanted to talk about uh, validation. Hmm? I mentioned that. Well, uh, validation, uh, when, when, when we uh, calculate the Krieging standard deviation, which is a measure of the uncertainty in our interpolated value, which is, has the nice property that it is spatially explicit, that each and every location we get to know how accurate our prediction is. But it is based on a model, on assumptions. Uh, you remember maybe the stationarity assumption, a constant mean or uh, the variogram, uh, we assume that the variogram is true. We assume that the variogram, the semivariance, only depends on the distance between locations and not on where the locations are. So we have a geostatistical model. We make lots of assumptions. So those Krieging measures of uncertainty, the Krieging standard deviation, is based on those assumptions. It is not model-free. So if we do a, um, 
a validation, yeah, we can do that. Huh? We can also objectively, without making assumptions, characterize the uncertainty. Uh, using validation. And uh, when would that be useful? Uh, yeah, if we don't want to rely on the many assumptions that the Kriegian model makes, hmm? we want to have a model-free estimate of the uncertainty. And uh, maybe if you have to go to court, to the lawyer, uh, to the judge, uh, they, they want to know, are you really sure, uh, or did you make some assumptions? Maybe sometimes you cannot afford to make those assumptions. So you would like to have a model-free estimate. Uh, but the price you have to pay, like I said before, it's you get only like a summary measure. The mean error for the whole area, the root mean squared error for the whole set of validation points. Uh, actually, so if we make a map, so this is our study area. Uh, we make, uh, predict the soil property, the pH of the soil, or the lead concentration of soil everywhere, and we want to do a validation. So we select points, and at these points we collect independently validation data. So at each of these points we have the predicted value, and we have the true value. And we can, uh, well, We could sum them for all validation points and maybe compute the average, would give me the mean error, right? Or maybe I would compute the average of the squared differences, would give me the mean squared error. Well, that's all very nice, but it's only, b it's really refers to those n validation locations. Whereas actually, we would like to know for the whole study area, how well do I do? Huh? Maybe mathematically I could write something like, uh, if this study area is uh, area A, I would like to do an integration over all locations in A. I would like to know zx minus z hat x squared dx, right? Just mathematically, we would actually like to know how well do we do for the whole study area. But the only thing we have are those finite number of validation point locations. So what we compute here is basically only an estimate of the true mean squared error for the whole area. And we need to make sure that we have enough of those validation points. Uh, I remember we were talking with, I think with you, like you had uh, I don't know, 30 validation points in your study area, and you get, uh, hey, when I do regression creaking, it gets worse than when I do ordinary creaking, or only regression. Why is that? Well, also a little bit depends, of course, on how large is your validation data set. If you have, by accident, you might do better or worse, but you really would like to know how well am I doing for the whole study area. So it's good to be aware that what we compute is only refers to are validation locations, and it's only an estimate of what we actually want to know. Now, the nice thing is uh, if those validation locations would have been selected with probability sampling, random sampling, uh, well, simple random sampling, stratified random sampling, and uh, well, there's lots of sampling algorithms, then we would actually be able also to quantify how close is this estimate of the mean squared error to the true mean squared error. Again, with a confidence interval. And then we could say, uh, well, with regression, the MSE is 25 plus or, plus or minus 3. With regression Krieging, it is 23 plus or minus 4. I don't know. And then we would be able to tell whether we have a significant difference, yes or no. So because we would be able to quantify the accuracy of our estimate, but for that you need a probability sample of your validation locations. So you cannot just use convenience sampling or just what you happen to have for your validation. You can use that for your validation. You still get an estimate, but you don't know how good that estimate is. 
So if you want to know more about this, uh, there is a paper, uh, yeah, you cannot read that, but Dick Brus, I think many of you maybe will know about, he's my uh, co our colleague here in Wageningen, and in the, uh, he has, uh, he's an expert on sampling, so we have a paper on that from 2011 already on how to do this sampling for validation of digital soil maps. So, but in practice, often we don't have the luxury position that we can do an independent collection of data for validation with a probability sampling. So we often use the data that we happen to have. And sometimes we even don't have that luxury position. We would like to use all the data we have also for the prediction. And then we could use a cross-validation, right? I did mention it to some of you on Monday, and maybe Tom has mentioned it, or Bas. Uh, there's this idea about leave one out cross-validation, I think familiar to most of us. You put one observation aside, use the others to predict at that location, then you can compare, and then you repeat that pr procedure for all observations. Okay. But what is important is that we don't use those validation observations to make our predictions. They have to be independent, because otherwise we would think that we do better than we actually do. And another point, maybe just good to mention, when you do a validation and you compare your prediction with the true value and you see a difference, we usually blame it on our prediction. Huh? Say, oh, the prediction is far off from the true value. Uh, that's okay, but if that true value is actually only a measurement which has a big measurement error, maybe that deviation, the difference between these two, is not only due to our poor prediction, but also due to a poor measurement. So take that into account as well. Okay, where are we? Ah. And we have like 20 more minutes, so maybe we will do uh, be just okay. Yeah. <laughs> Now we want to talk about uh, the, the carbon stock estimation and also look at uh, the uncertainty propagation there. Yes, now we have a question. Let's go back to the previous one. When we did the random forest, we had to ask the bag. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't have the data for the data. Is that sufficient for validation? Or do you need to validate the whole project? So out of bag, is that, it's sort of a cross-validation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. One by one, or you one third. One, third. one third. And you did that only once, so you repeated it three times? Repeatedly. Or? Repeatedly. Then you have to ask how many Who's times you want to do it. Oh, yeah. You can even do it a hundred times. Yeah. 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 No, that's fine. I think so. I mean, when I said cross-validation, uh, and I mentioned this leave one out cross-validation, there's also what they call the k-fold cross-validation, like ten-fold cross-validation. You would split your data sets in 10 equal parts and use 90% to predict the remaining 10 and do that 10 times. So I think we're talking pretty much about the same kind of concepts. Yeah. When you do this machine learning, uh, I'm not really an expert, but then you sometimes need to split the data set into three parts. So you have your validation data, then you have your remaining data, but you split that also into two parts because when you do uh, machine learning, you have these hyperparameters, like uh, the, the degree of uh, the pruning and, and things like that. So you need to optimize those as well. Uh, you need a data set to check what, is, what are the best values for the hyperparameters. So you put some data aside for that, and then the remaining part you, you use to calibrate your model, given the chosen values of the hyperparameters. So I think uh, you don't want to do base your validation on data that you have used. They have to be truly independent. Not use them for prediction, but also not use them for choosing the structure of your model, the hyperparameters, the degree of complexity. Okay, so they really have to be truly independent. But I think what you do uh, that does that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Right. So, uh, well, soil grids uh, produces maps of soil properties like the organic carbon concentration of the soil. 
uh, the bulk density of the soil and uh, percentage of coarse fragments of the soil. So when we want to compute actually the soil organic carbon stock for a certain layer, a horizon, we need to multiply the concentration with the thickness, the horizon thickness, the thickness of the layer, multiply it with the bulk density, uh, multiply it with the remaining part after the coarse fragments have been removed, and then we will get the carbon stock. And uh, well, there's a thousand here and a hundred, it is ju just to get the units in place, right? So that would produce me organic carbon stock in kilogram per square meter for a certain layer. So we can do that for every layer, and then we can aggregate over those layers. And well, I've, I, I mentioned this global soil map uh, project before, so we have these standard depths where we predict uh, soil properties. So this is a very simple model that allows us to compute the carbon stock for every location given those basic soil properties. And that is what you will do in the computer practical. And if we can do that for every location, for every grid cell, we can also add it all up to get the carbon stock for the whole area. And we can do that also for the whole world. Man, we did that in SOGRID, and you get an estimate of the total carbon stock of the world. Well, we won't do the whole world, we will do this area in Indonesia. But using this, this approach, uh, the area that we will work with in the computer practical is uh, this tile, this square area in uh, Borneo, Indonesia. So I think this is a map of the topsoil organic carbon concentration, but we will have multiple maps, different depths, different soil properties. So in the computer practical, we will actually use 12 maps, that which I just downloaded from the soil grids. Uh, bulk density, coarse fragments, organic carbon concentration at 0, 5, 15, and 30 centimeter depth. So we will be calculating the carbon stock of the top 30 centimeter of the soil. Uh, here are a few of those maps, but you will look at them in the computer practical. And this is the output, but you will reproduce that also. Now we only not only want to compute those carbon stock maps, we also want to compute the uncertainty in those maps. And there we need the uncertainty propagation, right? Because we have uncertainty in the organic carbon concentration, we have uncertainty in the bulk density, we have uncertainty in the percentage coarse fragments. And those uncertainties will all propagate through that simple model, that model which is just a multiplication of three factors. Now, we could use uh, a cross-validation approach. Um, but we also want to, and we will do that actually, so we will use global cross-validation statistics and they, uh, we can criticize that, it's also in the manual. Actually, that is the problem, I think uh, somebody asked that very, on, on yeah, it was you, <laughs> from uh, uh, on Monday to Tom, does soil grids also give the uncertainties of the maps? Uh, and if we would have used Krieging, we would have been able to quantify those uncertainties with a Krieging standard deviation map. But we use machine learning, and machine learning is much more difficult to quantify the uncertainty. And we're working on that because we do want to stick to those global soil map specifications that any map we produce also gives us the uncertainty. And what the current product of soil grids does is just only quantifies the uncertainty as a summary measure based on cross-validation. So that's the best we can do also today. So we will use those summary measures based on cross-validation. How accurate on average is the carbon concentration map? How av accurate on average is the bulk density map to characterize our uncertainty with probability distributions? And we also want to look at how does the spatial correlation in those errors uh, influence our results? Does it affect yes or no? You will figure it out during the computer practical and then when we do the feedback, will try to interpret why you got the results that you got. And we not only want to predict the carbon stock at each grid cell, but also the average for that 
square area with the uncertainty. Now we will do that in the practical with the Monte Carlo method, but because this model is so simple, it's just multiplying three variables one with another, we can also use a much faster uncertainty propagation technique, which is called the Taylor series method. And I'll explain that also briefly in a few slides, because that is also a technique that we will be using in the computer practical. Okay, so uh, we had this slide which says input, model, output. So mathematically we could also write output O is a function F of input U1, U2 up to Um. So we have the output is a function of the inputs. And the inputs are uncertain. In our case, we have uh, carbon stock is uh, carbon concentration multiplied with bulk density multiplied with 100 minus coarse fragments divided by 100. Something like that we had, right? So basically we have an output, the carbon stock, which is a function, mathematical function of the inputs. In our case, basically this multiplied with that, multiplied with this. And those inputs are uncertain. We don't know them exactly. So the uncertainties in these inputs will propagate to the output. And we can use Monte Carlo, we sample from the inputs, we run our models, do that many times. In this way we can track, we can trace how large the uncertainty in the output is given the input. But there is also more a mathematical technique, Taylor series method, which also does that. But it, it sort of linearizes this function. I'll have a next slide where it's a little bit explained uh, uh, how, how that works, but basically by making this Taylor series approximation, you can also compute the uncertainty in the output from the uncertainty in the input. And this is then the equation that you get. And if we look at this equation, we get that uh, uncertainty in the input contributes to uncertainty in the output. But a little bit depends on this value. This is the partial derivative of the function with respect to the input. Basically, it tells me how sensitive is my model to changes in the input. So this method, the nice thing about this method is that we get actually a mathematical equation that tells us how big is the uncertainty input in the output given uncertainty in the input. And obviously it tells us that if the un input has a high uncertainty, a wide probability distribution, a large variance, a large standard deviation, then the output uncertainty will also be higher. But that's not the only thing that matters. It also depends on how sensitive are changes in the input to uh, how sensitive is the model to changes in the input. The partial derivative. Maybe we should look at a, at, an, at a graphical illustration. So what I've done here, I have taken the example where I have only one input. So I don't have like one, two, three, or in general m. I just have output is a function of the input, just for graphical illustration. The input is on the x-axis. The output is on the y-axis. The red line is my function, my model f. So if I'm uncertain about the input, means I don't know the input exactly. It is a probability distribution. 
with some uncertainty. So then, because I'm uncertain about the input, I will also be uncertain about the output. That's all that there is to it, yes? Awesome. It's, it's, it's nice when you can evaluate a product like this at different tiers. You can break it down. When you provide a general service, you don't have this much fear of looking at the, the top of the tier. So how, and the reason why I'm saying is that I'm, I'm, some of the work I'm working on is providing services. When you provide a surface model, a surface model, yeah. which is? Like an elevation model. Right. right. Without uncertainty. Without uncertainty. Have yeah. you ever seen an elevation model with uncertainty? I've never. It yeah. always gives you, it always gives you the, the worst, I mean, the best case scenario will give us probably a vertical error. So a vertical error surface, I've seen one of those. But yeah. generally, if you're dealing with 5, 10, 15, 20 meter intervals, even if you look at a one arc second, the SRTN, it's a generalized surface model across there. And it tells you that there's error in there. And it even tells you where the error could occur. Yeah. But it doesn't give you yeah, yeah. the location of that. So how, how do you rationalize the use of that product? Because what, I, what I've seen is that the error is, the error is there. You pick it up. Yeah. The error that you're talking about. And, and it's, it's, it's very localized. Some areas have performed better depending on the scale that you work at. But my, my question is, if, is if any of your colleagues said, do, do a surface product for us, yeah. you would do a generalized surface product. Yeah. With, with so uh, if, if I understand you correctly, then you're saying like, if that's all very nice, this uncertainty propagation, but I can only do it if I know how uncertain my input maps are, like a digital elevation model. Usually, I, you, people give me a digital elevation model, but they don't tell me what is the uncertainty about that map. So how could, could I ever propagate the uncertainty? There's obviously, there are nugget effects, so it's, it's, there's a there is a, a, a a correlation between where this occurs. So you might find that where you have a higher, a high degree of terrain variability, you have yeah. a higher probability of error. Yeah. No, right? That's for sure. But, but because I, we, I yeah, we know, we know that intuitively. But how do you quantify it? So well, that's what this module is about, right? <laughs> With our approach is to model that uncertainty using probability distributions, right? With a spread. Like for, I can give you some examples, uh, publications that we've worked on and or other from other people, where the uncertainty in the dig digital elevation model is modeled using geostatistical approaches. So if you have a DEM, but you also have control points where you measure the true elevation, and you find your deviations, right? You have your <laughs> your DEM. And at some control points, you measured, oh, the actual elevation is like this. I don't know. So you have these observed errors between DM and true elevation. Well, we can use geostatistics to model the spatial correlation structure of these errors we would get a probabilistic, a statistical model, geostatistical model of the error in our DEM. And we could use the spatial stochastic simulation to generate possible true elevations. Of course, you need control points, uh, accurate measurements, to tell how accurate is my... Or you have to ask an expert, tell me SRT, MDM, what is the, mm, the error of this map in, in rough terrain, in flat terrain? Uh, because for sure you're right that in mountainous areas, the error is bigger than in flat terrain. So all that we need in order to be able to do this uncertainty propagation, we need to know what is the uncertainty in the inputs of our model, because otherwise we cannot propagate it to the output. And I think one of the first slides this afternoon was, why is it important to pay attention to uncertainty? Uh, and maybe some people refuse, but I know I was glad that the Danish government says, we want to know the accuracy. The thing, the, the thing is, uh, the, uh, about this, uh, this uh, controlling point, it's actually, I can say those are independent validation. If I do that, for example, the carbon, yeah. right, and then, uh, it's independent the validation point. I predict then I get the prediction <coughs> residual. And the point is, uh, for the digital elevation model, this controlling point that uh, you can really get a measure, in, and uh, it's a relatively accurate. Thing. 
Yeah. But uh, in a real life, when we when we do the re, uh, DSM, the the observation data from the different resources is not is quite uncertain. Yeah. So then we are back to where we were. Uh, like I said before, when you have validation data, or in this case control points, we presume, we assume here that these values are very accurate, at least a higher accuracy, maybe order of magnitude, more accurate than your DEM. So if these control point data, and maybe for elevation it's not a problem, but if we talk about digital soil mapping, and we have additional data measured in the field to, to quantify the accuracy or the uncertainty in our map, of course, we assume that those measurements are sufficiently accurate. And if they are not, then we have to take that into account one way or another. I'm not saying it's easy, right? But I th I'm saying it's important that we pay attention to the uncertainty and to the accuracy. And if we, we, we have mathematical theory, statistical theory, geostatistics, for example, which allows us to characterize uncertainties, by models, by, by statistical models. But we need data to calibrate such a model. Uh, we need to have observed errors and also a sufficiently large number, for example, to estimate the semivariogram. But it's not like uh, this is uh, somewhere in a ut utopia or, I mean, we have done a lot of these kind of analysis and lots of people have done. So to characterize uncertainty in maps by calibrating models that use observed errors in this map uh, to, to train those models, yes? Just, and, and sort of, not just a silly question, but that's just a graphical representation, because is there, is there a reason why the y-axis variation should not be relatively the same as the, the x-axis? See where it's got input there? See how it's quite flat? Yeah. On your graph, it's quite flat? Yeah. The yeah. Second, the, why is that one so peaked? It shouldn't be that peaked. Yeah, I was, I was trying to explain it, and then you came with your question. Oh, so uh, that, is, <laughs> that is no problem at all, <laughs> but I haven't explained that yet, okay. right? Yeah. So maybe we can go back to this now. This is really about uncertainty propagation again. So assuming we are able to characterize the uncertainty in our input, be it a digital elevation model, be it a digital soil map, I don't care. And now we want to analyze, we have, we assume we can characterize uncertainty in our input. How does that propagate through our environmental model to the output? Uh, this could be uh, soil organic carbon concentration. This would be the carbon stock. This could be uh, soil nutrients. This could be uh, crop yield, right? So that's the, what we're looking at now. This function f is some kind of mechanistic or environmental model that computes output from input, but the input is uncertain. It's just a one-dimensional case where we have only one single input, just for graphical illustration. The input is on this axis, but we are uncertain about the input. For example, most likely value is here, but there is some spread. Or a second case, most likely value of the input is like this, but we're quite uncertain about it. Eh? And I think in the purple case, we are much more uncertain, because it's a much wider distribution, than in the blue case, right? So we have uh, two cases, one where the input uncertainty is quite not so big, one where the input uncertainty is quite big, because it's a wide distribution. Now when we propagate, we actually find, and that is your, now your next question, why is the un output uncertainty here much less than here? Right? Because the width of the distribution really characterizes the degree of uncertainty. So we have two cases, one where input uncertainty here is lower than here, but actually the output, the uncertainty here, is higher, bigger than here. Why is that? Yes? Because of this part of the derivative. Exactly, yeah. It is, of course, it's to do with uh, what I showed here. It's not only the magnitude of the uns input uncertainty that matters, but also how sensitive is my model to small changes in the input. So if you look here, uh, in this domain of the input, 
a small change in the input leads to a pretty big change in the output. Here, a small change in the input only leads to a small, uh, 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 well, a bit large change in the input, sorry, actually leads to only a small change in the output because the model is not very sensitive. Uh, if the model would actually, the red line would be a horizontal line at some part, and my input would be somewhere along that line, but it's all horizontal, then the output uncertainty would be zero. We would know the output exactly because it doesn't care what value the input. That's what I try to explain here. So the degree of uncertainty propagation not only depends on how uncertain is the input, but also how sensitive is the model to changes in the input. Okay. Uh, let me see. Yeah, we should stop now, but I think we have one, two, two more slides. So I'm if you're okay with that, we will just finish it. Yeah. Okay. Now we want to apply this this Taylor series method to our example of computing the carbon stock from these three inputs. And then we need the derivative, so I'm not sure how, how familiar you are with that. I learned that at secondary school, but I'm lucky that I have to teach it every year again, so I don't forget about it. But maybe it's a long time ago that you were able to do mathematical differentiation. But if you would work it out, this is what you would get. So, uh, well, basically, uh, this is just an example, one pixel, one uh, block, where we have values for the inputs to our model, the carbon concentration, the bulk density, the coarse fragments, these values over here, with uncertainty, a standard deviation given as well. So we can just apply our model to compute the carbon stock. Well, just fill it all in here, then you would get 203 ton per hectare. We can also use this mathematical equation where you have to add the value. I will just show it to you once more. So this would allow us to calculate how the uncertainty, the standard deviations, or the square of the standard deviations, right, would propagate from bulk density, carbon concentration, coarse fragments, to carbon stock but we also need the derivatives of that mathematical function with respect to those inputs. If you're curious to know how exactly does that work out, I can explain you later, but it is not that difficult, and then eventually you would get that the standard deviation of your organic carbon stock is given by this equation, so you need of course, you still need the bulk density, you need the coarse fragments, you need the organic carbon, but you also need the uncertainty in the bulk density, the uncertainty in the coarse fragments, and the uncertainty in organic carbon. So those are the ingredients that you need to analyze how the uncertainty propagates through this Taylor series method, right? We can also do it with the Monte Carlo method. We will do both during the computer practical but this is how that mathematical equation works out for this example where we multiply three properties. And then we would find for this specific example that the uncertainty about the organic carbon stock is 44 ton per hectare, which is relatively small compared to the predicted value. Okay. So, uh, yeah. We sort of discussed everything now. Uh, we looked as a wrap up at uh, error, uncertainty. What is it? Why is it important? How can we model it statistically? It is again, like also money, it's a bit of a crash course, but the idea really is when we are uncertain about a soil property, we don't know its true value, the best we can do is make a list of all possible values of that soil property and attach a probability to each of those possible values. We can't do any better than that because we are uncertain about it. So we basically end up 
with a probability distribution. And that probability distribution can be very complex. It doesn't need to be a normal distribution. It could be another distribution. We have spatial correlations that have to be included. Well, the geostatistics allows us to do that. We didn't really talk about cross correlations. We will do a little bit about that during the computer practical. It may well be that the error in the carbon concentration is correlated with the error in the bulk density. So if you want to really do it well, you also have to take those correlations into account. Not only the spatial correlations, but also the cross correlations. My goal is really that you have get a bit of a feel for that. And we don't need to understand all the details. If you're interested, we can go in more detail separately. But that you get an idea that you characterize uncertainty with probability distributions, which can be quite complex. But there is statistical theory that allows us to come up with those probability distributions if we, of course, also have sufficient data to train, to calibrate those statistical models, like we did over here. And then we also talked a little bit about how does uncertainty then propagate, because the digital soil map that we produce is not the end product. It's just the starting point for a subsequent analysis where our users or our colleagues need those maps to compute something else, like uh, crop, crop yield or, well, erosion and all these kinds of things. So, and then those uncertainties will propagate and maybe we, it's useful to pay attention to that as well. We talked a little bit about validation. It's perfect in that sense that it is objective. It is not based on assumptions. But the downside is that it is only gives us like a summary measure of how, how well did we do. And we start to talk a little bit about the carbon stock and how the uncertainty is propagated, but we'll do spend much more time on that in the computer practical. So I think for sure we need a break.